everybody's here. So welcome everybody to Maven's first official inside scoop. We're going to be interviewing today Baylor University's admissions representative, uh, the assistant director of admissions, Amira Alvarado. Very excited and grateful to have you here with us today, Amira. Yes, I'm excited to be here. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Um, so before I give the mic to Amira to take over. I'm just going to go through a little bit of housekeeping and introduce Amira. So you should have uh, on your screen three options for Q&A, uh, chat, and raise your hand. So you can just check and make sure that you have those. Um, the way this is going to run is we're going to have a little bit of a presentation from Amira first, and then I've got some interview questions for her to answer about some details about the school. And then if you have any questions during the whole process, Go ahead and put them in the Q&A, and then at the end, we're going to get back around to those questions and answer them for you. So um, a little bit about Amira. She was born right here in Southern California, in Claremont, California, and she's been with Baylor for the past five years in their admissions office. Uh, she loves the community and, and especially meeting alumni from Baylor out here in California because it's that instant bond of having that shared experience from another part of the country together so you get that quick family and her favorite place she reports is Spice Village in Waco near campus so I'm hoping she'll tell us a little bit about that. Uh, another fun fact about Amira is that she has been traveling since she was six months old and she's lived in Nicaragua for over 11 years so she loves traveling, exploring new foods, cultures, watching movies and baking except for scary movies. I understand that one's the one that breaks your list so uh, We've also got some contact information here on the side. If you want to reach out to her afterwards, you've got her email and her direct line. I got that straight from their website, and there's also a link to their uh, uh, admissions um, uh, events that are going to be upcoming. So we'll come back around to that later. And now, without further ado, I'm going to pass the screen over to Amira. So let's see if I can make you the host here and let you present what you've got for us. Great, thank you. I did want to clarify, I was actually um, born in Saudi Arabia oh, wow. and moved to California when I was 11. So have a little bit of different experiences and that kind of thing. Um, oh, wow. So yeah, I, I do love to travel. I love meeting people and um, definitely. That's right. I remember you mentioned that last time we spoke. So you yeah. moved out here to SoCal when you were 11 years old. Mm -hmm. Similar. I moved to China when I was 13. It's quite an international world these days. Yeah. All right, so let's hear from Amira about Baylor. Okay, can you see my screen okay? Yeah, can everybody just uh, raise your hand real quick and make sure that you can see your screen? Okay, good. Yeah, I see four, five, three. Yeah, looks like everybody's with us. Good, great. All right, I think we're all together. Great, thanks so much. So um, again, I'm Amira with Baylor, and we are a private Christian university located in Waco, Texas. If you're not familiar with Texas, it's okay. I wasn't either before I moved there for college. Um, but Waco is um, about an hour and a half south of Dallas and an hour and a half north of Austin. Um, and Waco is definitely not a huge city, but I think it is a great college town. It is a great complement to what Baylor does offer as a university. Um, we are, this is just a statistic, um, best ranked number 78 um, on best colleges in U.S. News and World Report. Uh, we have over, we have 14,000 students on campus, so we're a good mid-sized school, but our average class size is only 26, and we have a um, student fact ratio of 14 to 1. We have over 140 majors. They're all des designed for you to graduate in four years. They're not impacted. You can apply undecided. If you change your major along the way, that's no problem. You'll just email me, and I'll um, update that for you. You can change your major once you get to Baylor, but we do want you to graduate in four years, so hopefully you're not making a decision, you know, sometime your sophomore year to change to something completely different. Um, some of our top programs are pre-med program, pre-law, business, engineering, um, but we have really great programs across the spectrum, education, nursing, um, some really great opportunities. Our pre-med program is really strong, probably one of our largest um, program students who choose a major to go alongside the pre-med track. And for most students choose biology or something in the sciences, but you're not limited to that. If you wanted to choose something like business or um, in another area, you're welcome to do that. Um, for students who have about a three, four, three, five during their junior year, they'll meet with our committee process and uh, work with professors to get you ready for 
that um, applying for med school, doing your MCAT, doing essays, um, interviews, and those students have a 72% acceptance rate into law school, which is about double national average. Our pre-law program has about an 89% acceptance rate into law school. Our business school um, has pretty close to 100% job placement within three months of graduating within the different majors. One thing to know about Frit business is our students do start as a pre-business student, and you'll do two years of general ed and general business. At the end of your sophomore year, that's when you would declare your major in whichever area you're interested in. Um, our entrepreneurship is ranked sixth or seventh in the nation continually, so it's a really strong program. Uh, we definitely want our students to get hands-on experience outside of the classroom. So we are in the process of becoming a, t a tier one in our research one institution, but we do have research available for students starting from freshman year. At a lot of schools, research is really limited to students, um, graduate students, but for students at Baylor, you can start your freshman year, probably not your first semester because you're getting used to college and all of that, um, but we have a program where you can start your own research or works alongside professors. Other opportunities um, are internships. Students always ask me about internships, and a lot of degrees have them built into their program. Um, and a lot of students will do those over the summer, so you can come back here, devote more time to your internship, do it out here at home over the summer. If you did want to do an internship in Waco, there are businesses in Waco. Again, not a huge city, but there are businesses. A lot of students will do um, internships even on campus as well. So we definitely want you to get that hands-on experience that's going to build up your resume while you're kind of going through college. Um, our professors are very available. They are very intentional. They love to connect with their students. So they all hold office hours um, and they really do want to get to know their students outside of the classroom. Students ask me like, am I gonna have TAs teaching me? Is it grad students? And for the most part, all of your lectures will be taught by your professors. You might have a lab component to like a bio class that might be taught by a grad student, but in general, your professors are the ones teaching all your lectures. I mentioned the average class size is 26. For some of the sciences, the average class size does stay a little bit larger because it is such a large program. Um, but again, there still is a lot of um, interaction with professors. It's not uncommon for them to have students over for dinner, um, reach out if a student doesn't do well on an exam. You're definitely not a number at Baylor. And when I was thinking about college, I always kind of pictured it like in the movies with those huge halls. And I thought, how would even a professor know that you were even in the classroom? And so at Baylor, um, even with what I think we'll talk about it later with COVID, but even just how intentional professors are now with their students, even though we're online. Um, one thing that is definitely important to us is diversity at Baylor. It's something we are always trying to improve. So right now we have about a 38% um, percent of uh, students who are from different minorities. And we do have a multicultural fair office who they um, set up different programs, activities. And I'll talk a little bit later about student organizations as well. But there's definitely something that we um, want to try to continue to improve. California is our highest out-of-state population. It's been like that since I went to Baylor a really long time ago. Um, and so you won't feel like you're the only student from California or non-Texan um, by any like stretch of the imagination. I did want to mention our honors college. Um, I know most schools do have an honors college, but I really like the way ours is set up. We have mm -hmm. two programs and two majors. Um, the programs are tracks that kind of go alongside your major. So honors program is a traditional program where you take honors courses, you write a thesis, but again, you still do, you do research, but again, you still do have your major. The Baylor Interdisciplinary Core um, is a really neat program where instead of taking, you know, gen ed courses like English and history, you take combined courses in different disciplines like world cultures one and two, um, rhetoric, again, a, a lot of smaller class sizes, seminar versus a lecture. And with um, BIC, you do have to start that as an incoming freshman. Um, because it is an eight semester program. With honors program, you could add that on after your first semester if you decide you want to. The other two, um, the majors listed on here, University Scholars is probably our most selective major on campus. Um, it's for students who have a wide variety of interests because you essentially pull from different disciplines and make your own major. So it's a really neat opportunity. Um, but again, it's pretty selective. So I think they only accept about 50 students each um, year for that. What Three was that major called? I'm sorry? Oh, what was that last major? Oh, University Scholars. University Scholars. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, the Great Text is really good fit for students who are pre-law students. Um, you really delve into all of the foundational texts, learn how to pull things out of them. So it's a really good fit for um, pre-law students. I will be honest, I don't get a lot of Great Text students, but it is something that you could even minor in if you wanted to or even add as a secondary major. 
with the Honors College, it's one application for all four areas. So you just have to check off what you want to be reviewed for, um, and then you can go from there. Uh, I'll talk about the application process later, but with honors, they don't review students until you're admitted to Baylor, but it is a good idea to apply at least by December, January of your senior year, because some of the programs do fill up and start a waiting list. Um, with Honors College, we do have a residential college that students can live in, but you're not required to, but it does, again, foster that sense of community that a lot of students are looking for. Um, like most programs, like most schools, sorry, we do have a, start, a study abroad program, um, but again, community is really important at Baylor, so we do have the opportunity for you to travel with a group of Baylor students and a Baylor professor. We have programs all over the world. They start, um, you can go the summer after your freshman year. You can do a semester, a summer, a year-long program. It really just depends what you want to do, where you want to go. Some of the programs are more major-specific, like our um, Costa Rica program is for education students. Um, nursing students have specific programs that they can do, but then there are some that are open to all students. I would say the most popular one is Baylor in Maastricht, which is in the Netherlands. And so students go there and then travel. Um, they travel all throughout Europe, and it's a really fun way to like nice. see a lot of countries, but also get class credit, be with a Baylor professor and students. Um, okay. one unique How thing many students, was, what percentage of students would you say participate in uh, yeah, I would say study abroad? It's funny. I would say 80% of students tell me they want to do study abroad, but I would say probably about only a third of our students will actually go through study abroad. Um, yeah, I recommend about right. that you reach out to our Global um, Engagement Office Center, Center for Global Engagement, your first uh -huh. semester at Baylor, and just say like, hey, I really want to go to Spain. What are my options? And they'll kind of look at your degree plan and figure out when a good time to go to Spain would be. I mean, I think any time is a good time to go to Spain. Well, not right now, but in general, any time is a good time to go to Spain. <laughs> yeah, right uh, but they'll help you figure out like what the best program is and where you should go and what would be a good fit for you. Um, we do also, we were starting a new program this fall called Start Abroad for students who definitely want that global experience. And we were going to allow students to do their first semester in Dublin. We did have to cancel it this year, although we did have a lot of students really excited about it. Um, but that's something that we're hoping that we can have for next year. So you would do your first semester in Dublin, um, take classes at the Dublin Business School. You live off campus, so you really have like a um, independent life. But Dublin's such a – actually, it's one place I have not been. Uh, but it's such a great like walking city and just historical. It's kind and so, of like a merger uh, between a gap year and a freshman year. <laughs> exactly, yeah. So it's exactly for students who think they want to do a gap year, this is a great fit because you can do a gap year kind of, but gap semester, but still get credit for your class for sure. Right, right. Yeah, I've seen uh, these programs be more popular at different schools. Mm -hmm. Yes, definitely. I think um, Marist has the same program at Dublin. Yeah, NYU school. does too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they have a uh, Dubai and different places. Yeah, and it's the first semester abroad program. I've just started seeing them crop up in the last few years. Mm -hmm. And it's not a thing like, oh, I can't get into Baylor Waco. They'll just let me go to Dublin. You actually do have to apply for it and be a good fit for the program. So it's a solid program for sure. I'm really excited about it. I'm hoping that somehow they'll find a reason to send me to go do something over there. I'm sure you can find a good um, reason. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, so I just want to talk through student life. Students always ask me, what's campus like? What do students do? Um, really, truly, if you sit in your dorm room and don't get out and do anything, you're going to have a hard time adjusting anywhere you go to college it's going to be an adjustment you're going to go through a period of homesickness but we really want students to get involved and get connected um, so we do have a lot of different opportunities i mentioned student organizations we have over 330 for you to choose from if we don't have what you want which i would be surprised you can of course always start your own organization but we do have groups everything from multicultural um, service, social. Um, we do have Greek life, but we're not a go Greek or go home campus. So if you want to get involved, great. But if you decide it's not the right fit for you, there are tons of other ways to get involved. We also have deferred rush. So instead of coming before early before your first semester and kind of making that decision, you'll come back after Christmas break and go through the rush process. Um, but back to organization, um, again, religious, social, really a little bit of everything. Uh, this is just our student life center. It's where our gym facilities are, the tallest indoor walk wall in Texas. Um, there's also a river next to campus, and there's um, a marina there that students go kayaking, paddle boat, boating. Is that kayaking, an indoor hiking. river for the kayak? Oh, sorry? Is that the like Brazos an indoor river. stationary river for the kayak? <laughs> no, it's just the Brazos River. I think it's the longest river in Texas, if I'm not No, I saw it, like, it seemed like a swimming pool in a kayak. Oh, this is like Yeah, so there's a whirlpool. We do have an indoor. So um, she's got like a stream that she's like, 
paddling against in there? Yeah, it's a whirlpool. That's and awesome. It also has um, a lazy river, which is yeah, yeah, yeah. Lazy <laughs> river for yeah. Kayaking. Um, so we are D one in the Big Twelve. So lots of big sports. Our basketball teams were doing amazing this season. Um, until we weren't, until we had to shut everything down. Our football team went to the Sugar Bowl, which was really exciting. Wow. Um, and so we, for those of you who aren't quite D1 level, we do have club and intramural sports. So club would be competing against other schools. Intramural is just things for fun like um, ping pong or bowling or um, cornhole, oh, just things for you to be involved in get active. Um, I mentioned we do have the Multicultural Affairs Office. These are students who are preparing for the Gateway to India presentation that they do every spring, which I'm really sad they couldn't do this spring. Mm -hmm. uh, but they do cultural presentations, food tastings, all those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's, again, a lot of opportunities to get involved. Mm -hmm. Service, there are no service requirements, but I would say it's a natural part of who our students are. So there are definitely a lot of opportunities to get involved. Um, we actually have one program called Step and Out, which happens each semester. So if you're not able to get involved on a more regular basis, there still are ways to connect and do something um, each semester. This year, we're actually doing something called Stepping In, and so we're finding different ways around the world that we can um, help our community from where we are, since we are all at home now. Um, and then just one other last thing, I think that before I talk about like application is traditions. We are um, the oldest university in Texas. We're actually older than the state of Texas. We were founded in 1845. Oh. I think technically we were founded in February, and Texas became a state in December, so less than a year, but we'll take it. <laughs> um, so we do have a lot of long-standing traditions, a lot of things to get involved in. Um, some of my favorite are the Baylor line. Um, so this is our football stadium. I mentioned the river right across campus. On the other side of the river is the stadium. And before every game, we um, have tailgating, but everything's bigger in Texas. So our students are actually out on the water um, sailgating, so in their boats and that kind of thing. So a really fun experience. Um, when I went to Baylor, our football team was bad. We didn't have a stadium. We had to go across town, but I still went to the games. It was still fun. But the Baylor line is a special opportunity for our first year students where you get a bright gold jersey, you put your nickname and class year on back, and before every home game, you run across the field and form a tunnel for the coaches and team to run through, and then you sit right on the 50-yard line um, cheering behind the opposing team so you can cheer them on during the game. Um, awesome. So all of your tickets for home games are included for in your student fees. So you're not having to worry about get getting tickets. And then you have some of the best seats in the house. Um, homecoming, we also have the oldest homecoming traditions in the nation dating back, I believe, to 1909. So students build a bonfire um, the night before the game on campus. They have a huge pep rally. And then, of course, the football game um, the next day. So lots of ways to get involved. Even as a freshman, you can get involved in building floats or being a part of floats. Uh, a random tidbit, Dr. Pepper was in invented in Waco. So every Tuesday we have free Dr. Pepper floats for our students. It's just kind of a way to take a break from classes and meet up with your friends. Last Tuesday, our president hosted um, a Dr. Pepper hour in her home where she and her husband and daughter kind of all talked and made Dr. Pepper floats and did like a Facebook <laughs> Live. So it's definitely special to us. Um, it's definitely the drink of Baylor. There's even a museum of Dr. Pepper that you can go to in Waco as well. Well, and then we do have two of, uh, bears, um, Joy and Lady, who live on campus, yeah. and they um, were little baby bear cubs when I was there. Now they're huge, of course, and our students are the bear trainers, um, so that's definitely something fun that will set you apart on your resume um, when you're applying for jobs that you get to be a bear trainer on campus. How do you, do how do you apply to be a bear trainer? Like, yeah, you have to have so some training for that, right? It's a student <laughs> group called Chamber, and so you just join the organization. I think they're you can start your sophomore year. And it's also, they're also the students who um, like lead, lead the cheers at the football game and they're really involved and um, <clears throat> it's a really fun for sure organization. One of my coworkers was um, in chamber at Baylor. So my first year working, we took us like behind the scenes and we got to go see the bears. And um, so they live in, in on campus, they live in a zoo. They're not just, it is Texas, but they're not just like wandering around. Um, so they do um, live in a taxi <laughs> zoo. That's probably pretty unique. There's actually a zoo in Waco as well, but we have one on campus. Um, so they're really small. Wow. So just a couple things I wanted to highlight. Um, of course, the return on your investment is really important. Um, within three months of graduating, 86% of our students, 86 to 100% of our students are either in job placement or grad school. So I'm, again, some of the programs like engineering and business are going to be closer to 100%. It just kind of depends on the program. Um, we have a great career and professional development office that they work with all majors and then specifically within your major, your professors will help you with um, 
job placement, internship, that kind of thing. We have um, schools calling our education department saying, hey, do you have any graduates that are looking for a job? And oftentimes this would happen, I would say, nursing, education, and business. The departments would say, we're really sorry, everybody already has a job. Um, so it's a really great, um, again, really great support. A lot of um, job fairs, internship fairs, they hold them. Um, there can be major specific, program specific. Um, it just kind of depends, but they're, they're doing virtual ones right now, so students are still having this opportunity as well. Um, and then I just wanted to touch on the alumni network I mentioned, or um, Aaron mentioned about how fun it is when I see like a Baylor sticker on a car. Um, I try not to scare them, but I'm always like, it's embarrassed when I drive up next to them. Um, <laughs> and so um, alumni is really important. The Baylor family is important. I would say this is throughout everywhere. Um, people helping find jobs. You are connected to a job database for life. Um, so there's definitely a lot of support once you graduate. And then these are just some of the places where people from Baylor end up working. Um, of course, this is not exhaustive, but just some you know big names where students do work. Um, Parents always ask me if students come back to California. I would say for sure. I did take that detour to Nicaragua. That's not normal. Um, most, I think students, a lot of them will go to the Dallas, Fort Worth or Houston area, depending on their job. But a lot of students do come back or go somewhere else. And then of course, you know, if they go on to grad school as well. Right. Um, and then there is support for our students. We do have <clears throat> free um, tutoring available in our success center. If students have learning differences, you can um, submit your paperwork for that and get accommodations as necessary. Um, there's SI tutoring, so students who have already taken the courses offer um, to, uh, like tutoring sessions, again, free tutoring. So you just have to take advantage. I would say wherever you go, look for the support that you need. Don't be embarrassed or shy. Reach out for what you need. It's there for you for sure. Mm -hmm. um, I'm just going to quickly go through the application process because I know Great. especially juniors are like, I just want to be a senior and, you know, finish the semester. So it's Great. okay if you don't remember this. I'm always available to answer any questions. Um, but we do have three options. for our, our application is free and we're on the Common App, um, our own application in Apply Texas. We don't have a preference, but I would say Common App is the easiest for our California students. Um, you, after you submit the Common App, you'll get an email to create your Go Baylor account. And that will really become your portal. It will have like a checklist and all of those things. But you don't need to create it until after you've submitted your application. So the required items, um, this of course is subject to change. But as of right now, your application, your ACT or SAT, we do super score both of those. I know a lot of the testing has been canceled. As of right now, again, we are still requiring them for the fall. But if there is a change, I know we'll update everybody if we either don't require them or go test optional. Yeah. Um, your transcript, you are able to upload an unofficial transcript and we can use that for an admission decision. Then we just need your official transcript after you've graduated or you can send an official one through Common so App. To upload well. that to the Common App or mm -hmm. to the portal? Yeah, this is for any of them. Um, you can okay. self-report your test scores in Go Baylor and you can upload um, your transcript through Go Baylor. You can also email me your transcript if you have any trouble. Okay. Um, and then the essay as well, we'll get from the Common App essay. Yeah. Um, so really, those are the only required items. Remember, it's free, so there's really no reason to not apply. Um, <laughs> but because it's free, it is really important to submit the recommended items because we are trying to find students who are a good fit for Baylor and vice versa. And so these are some of the ways that we're able to learn more about you. Connecting with me is great. I don't make decisions because I pretty much like everybody and everybody would get in. Um, but I definitely advocate for my students. I love to get to know my students and you know work with you, with your parents and everything. Um, so the recommended items would be a resume, the list of activities on Common App is a great start, but we want you to just kind of go one step further and actually upload a resume. Two recommendation letters, they can be academic, but they don't have to be. Um, and we we'll, can get them from Common App as well. And then we have a short answer response, which really should be like a paragraph or two of what are you looking for in a college and why do you want to go to Baylor? Um, so again, it's really- That's on the Common App, really right? The short answer um, response? Mm -hmm. The short answer is available on Common App, or you can do it in Go Baylor as well. It's okay. not available on Apply Texas. Okay. Um, and if you ended up doing our web app, it wouldn't be until after you submit the first part of the application. Yeah, most yeah. of our students are using Common App, so. Good, I love it's Common usually, App. Common yeah, App it's great. my preferred preference. Definitely, person. I think your teacher Zimi, is Zimi still around? I noticed you had that on this slide. I thought so they... we, it is, yeah, I can explain it. I kind of usually just, blow over it because it's not a lot of a lot no of I know what Zimi is I just kind of lost track of them so no I, you don't need to go into detail okay. we can, yeah. we can so explain it to our one kids one or the other is great 
Yeah, but either way, resume or Azimi. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, financial aid. I know this is an important piece um, to the conversation. Um, so we do, um, our merit scholarships are automatically awarded. They're based off of test score and GPA. Again, subject to change if we don't take test scores in the fall. Um, they range, this year, they range from 10 to 21,000 a year, and they are renewable for all four years. We do have a scholarship calculator online that you can go and use, put in your information, it will tell you what your scholarship is. And we do allow students to retest um, up until May 1st. We need the updated scores in order to increase or earn a scholarship. So the calculator is really helpful oh. because it will let you know. May like, 1st. So like after they've been admitted and while they're waiting to decide, they can retake the SAT to potentially get more merit scholarship money. Yeah. Yeah. That's, I don't know a lot of schools that do that. I, I haven't heard that loaded out very mm -hmm. ever <laughs> yeah yeah not, not yet <laughs> <laughs> yeah i i yeah i don't think that's it's the first common. um and again we do super score so you can just focus on the areas that's, that you need that's to really improve. great i mean that one test could make a difference of like five or ten k per year for a student right oh yeah for sure i have students who get in but don't qualify and then retest and bump up all the way to sixteen thousand. so like what would be like a a, a score range for mm -hmm being in good standing for those merit scholars? Yeah, I would say for the most part, the um, the lowest test scores would probably be like, and again, I don't know if this will change. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I know this is just kind of for yeah. frame of reference. Yeah, I've the most, the lowest scores I've seen with the scholarship is 1,225. And that would be like a $10,000 uh, $10, scholarship. 1,225. Um, 1200 on the SAT and yeah. 12, oh, oh, okay. 25 I see. On, the on the ACT. Mm -hmm. And then with the GPA, I mean, it doesn't have to be like a 3839, but probably like at least a 36. We do look at unweighted GPA. We recalculate back to the 4.0 scale, although we will look at the classes you've taken and the rigor and all so of that. Um, potentially but somebody with a 1200 SAT and a 3.6 could be looking at 10K a year in mm -hmm. merit aid. Yeah, and um, if you guys are taking notes, which I'm sure you are, if you write down baylor.edu slash estimator, um, that's the calculator link, and you can actually go in, if you have test scores now, you can go in and see what it would, what your scholarship would be. Once yeah, and graduate, since it's all our students here today, I will also say that on the, um, we use College Planner Pro, on, okay. under the, under the college, on the college profile page, you can also, we have a button that links directly to their financial aid uh, okay. calculator. It goes right to that URL. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, it's a really useful tool um, and definitely gives you a goal when you're retesting for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's great. Uh, so that's great information. Okay, so apart from the merit scholarship, we do have need-based aid. Um, we do require the FAFSA and the CSS profile. So Both. our priority deadline is November 1st and then February 1st, which I think I'm going to talk about deadlines next. I think you I require do. both FAFSA and CSS? We do. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Common for, for private schools, right? <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I think this is our second or third year actually requiring a CSS. So it's something on the newer end for us. Okay, yeah, yeah. CSS is pretty much standard for most private schools. Okay, right yeah. Which is probably why we're like, wait, why aren't we doing this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A little more oh, detailed. There should have been, sorry, there should have been a slide about deadlines for applications. Oh, um, okay, like, yeah. So real quick, I'll just go over it real quick and then um, any questions you guys yeah, have. Sure. Um, our November 1st deadline um, is early action as well as early decision. So early action is obviously non-binding. You'll have a decision by January 15th. And then early uh, decision is binding. You apply by November 1st. You have a decision by December 15th. But you're essentially saying if you get accepted, you will come to Baylor. Um, so for students who know who know, who know they want to come to Baylor, then early decision is great. If you're not exactly sure finances aren't 100%, early action is still a really great opportunity. And um, early action is November 1st deadline as well? Mm -hmm. Same yeah, deadline? Yeah, they're both November 1st. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's but then you hear back a month earlier for the ED. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and then we do have our regular decision February 1st. Um, okay. In general, I tell students to always apply early action. So much of our freshman class comes from that applicant pool. But if you are limited or restricted on other places, then that's no problem. Um, you can apply. What percentage first. of your class fills up from the EAED? I would say it's probably close to 60 to 70 percent. Wow. It could be even higher than that. that. That's interesting. And I wouldn't be surprised if it goes up even more this year because of all the uncertainty. Colleges want to lock students down 
as quick as yeah. they can, I bet, because everything is blowing in so many directions, right? Yeah, and actually this year we are planning to do an early decision two deadline, which will be new. And I'm sorry, I don't have the exact date, but I think it's oh. the deadline to apply is February 15th, and you find out really quickly if you're admitted. So that would be for students who maybe they're applying somewhere restrictive. They don't get or, into Yeah, they've applied another so ED, and they've yeah. yeah missed that one. So you've got an ED2 option, too. That's great. Yeah. Um, and I'm sorry, I know I kept say, keep saying I'm going to be done, but one thing I wanted to mention for high achieving students, there are opportunities to combine a campus visit with a scholarship opportunity. So I want you to be aware because there are deadlines earlier in the fall. So we have three programs that are direct entry to grad school. So we have Baylor to Baylor Medical, which is in um, with Baylor College of Medicine. And so very high achieving students, it's very selective, only six students are selected but Thanks. you apply it I know it's a lot I mean it's not a lot <laughs> there um, there are two uh, you have to apply to either come to campus in Waco in um, November or January and then from there they'll choose the next round where you would go in March to the Baylor College of Medicine in Houston but it is great because if you are one of the six, six selected um, you get entry into med school as well as scholarship opportunities um, so it's great. a really great opportunity we also have a similar program called Baylor to Baylor Law and so that would be to our law school where again this one usually only happens in January so you have to apply if you're selected you come out for the event and then um, you will get notification later on that we also have a Baylor to Baylor seminary which I'm not sure how they're going to change that this year but it would be for again direct entry into seminary mm -hmm. So medical um, then, law seminary? Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are like the direct entry programs. Um, then we have two other opportunities. Invitation to Excellence is for high achieving students. Um, and you apply for the event. It's in. It, it's the same weekend as the Baylor to Baylor Med. So if you're applying to that, you should definitely apply to Invitation to Excellence. Um, there's mm -hmm. one in November and one in January. If you're selected to attend and you come, it's a Friday evening and a Saturday. Just by attending, you'll get a one-time $2,000 scholarship and then you'll compete for a full tuition faculty scholarship. So it's, a, again, a really great opportunity. To you have to be admitted first? No. You apply. Mm. Um, so for the November event, the deadline is in September. So that's why I'm putting it out there now. And then for the January event, the deadline is early November. And so well, maybe after we're done, you could send me a couple of links. Yeah, that's that fine. Yeah, great. I don't need to get into these. Yeah, I can share that with everybody afterwards. Yeah, that's, that's great. great. Um, and then just the last one is Distinguished Scholar Days. These are put on by different departments. If you meet their test score requirement, you just register to attend the event. It's a one-day event that combines like a campus tour and all of that. And then you um, come back home and you'll write an essay to compete for a $3,000 renewable scholarship, which is stackable with your merit. Up to four years? Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. That's great. Yeah. So you can, that's a $12,000 essay if you get selected? Yeah, definitely. <laughs> that's a pretty good essay <laughs> to yeah. win. Yeah. That's great. That's awesome. Okay, All right. okay, yeah, so now I'm done, sick of bears. Oh, Sorry, excellent, well, <laughs> wave Family goodbye to the bears, bears, everybody. Um, let's see, I'm gonna go now into our little follow-up interview session, and I don't see if we, I don't think we have any, um, any questions yet, but we'll come back to those shortly. So let's see here. All right, so back to me. So this is, I think, the question that's really on everybody's mind these days Absolutely. while we're all going stir crazy, stuck at home, and our company is being forced to go online just like we all are here. So my question to you is how do you see this whole COVID-19 um, impacting admissions for students who've applied and who will be applying this fall? And what changes have you seen? I know you can't predict the future, but uh, if you have any ideas about what might be coming down, I'll throw that all out there for you to... Yeah, definitely. So, I, I mean, it was definitely a huge shock for everybody. Um, we are hoping that we can open campus in the fall. Our classes start mid-August, so we're hoping that in mid-August we'll have our students on campus and um, everything will be much in a much better position. But I would say there are people way above my pay grade coming up with the contingency plan in case that it isn't safe and we can't reopen. Um, we have launched a, a really big program called Summer of Discovery, where we're offering um, bundles of online summer courses at really, really discounted prices. 
to try to help students get engaged now and get connected and kind of get ahead on some of their classes. So it's for incoming seniors as well, um, incoming freshmen this fall, as well as rising seniors. Um, and I can send you more information about that. Um, as That's for as admitted students, students who are already attending? Both. So it's for, we have our current students who are going to get a discount. And then we also have um, for this, right, the rising freshmen. Classes. Yeah, freshmen. And then also, like, if you guys are juniors, there's a program opportunity for you as well to take classes this summer. Oh, and okay. it is tied with preferential acceptance into oh, wow. your, um Yeah, I'll send you all the information. Please. I won't bog you down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I love that. Um, but yeah, it's a really great opportunity. So we're just kind of trying to get students engaged and get them connected. As far as for the fall, I know I've said it a million times, we don't know what will happen with test scores um, and all of that. So as we have that information, we'll update our website. As far as if your class, if your school has gone to pass fail, that's not going to be an issue. We will know that when we're looking at your application and your transcript. Um, and so we will figure all of that out with, with your scholarship and all of that. Okay, great, great, great. Yeah. And just one more time quickly, what was the um, program that you just mentioned, the Summer Discovery for the yeah. juniors? Mm -hmm. Summer that, of Discovery. Yeah, summer so of you, Discovery. Yeah. And that's, so that's can, open to high school juniors as well right now? Yes. Okay, so yeah, we'll get more details. But for yeah. all of you that are trying to figure out what to do with your summer, <laughs> think about that Summer of Discovery option and at least if nothing more compared to any other options you've got, because it sounds like it might be some good stuff for you to do this summer. Okay, moving on. Next question. So you talked about this a little bit, but I just wanted to get a little bit more into detail about how you review applications from kind of the whole overview of the process and maybe where you fit in to kind of the big machine of what it is. Yeah. And then what are the more important things that you look for in that process? Yeah, definitely. So we do have an admissions committee, um, and I would say we do a holistic review for sure, mm -hmm. um, but academics are a very important piece because mm -hmm. we are not trying to have a, the incoming freshman come in, but really a graduating senior. You know, we want you guys to graduate and do well and be successful. So academics are important, but then again, we're looking at, again, fit is very important, why a student wants to come to Baylor, how they want to get involved, you know, what excites them about Baylor, um, if you think about it on our end, we're trying to find the students who, if we accept you, there's a good chance you're going to come. Um, you know, if you're like, we look at academic fit, um, uh, like social fit, all of those kinds of things. So we're and just demonstrated interest then would factor there as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. People yeah. actually so showing up on campus before applying. Um, so we understand that it's not easy to visit campus. So there definitely are other ways. I visit high schools all fall mm -hmm. long and I right. meet with, um, students um, it, for coffee appointments. I mean, even just like if we email you and you respond, we're looking at that. And um, so it's just like, I have students Engagement. who got waitlisted and they're like, why was I waitlisted? And I'm like, well, I've reached out to you probably a million times. I've never heard from you. I had no <laughs> idea you were interested. So I couldn't advocate for you because I mentioned I don't make decisions, but I definitely advocate for my students sometimes to a fault. <laughs> my supervisor's like, okay, I mean, we get it. Um, but I just, you know, I really believe in my students. And if, if you want to be at Baylor, I want to get you there for sure. And you say you advocate. So how many other people are there advocating for their students regionally around the country when it comes down to committee? Um, so as far as regionals, I'm in Southern California. We have one in Northern who covers the Northwest. Um, we have somebody in Chicago, somebody in Denver, two in Houston, and two in Dallas. And then, of course, all the Waco-based people. Yeah. Um, but it's not really like pitting one student against another. Sure. It's really just me advocating like, hey, um, or even just like putting a student, sometimes they'll say like, hey, we're looking at these students. Do you know them? And if I look through, then I can say, yeah, I've been in touch with, you know, mm -hmm. Mark and he's really interested and he's really excited about engineering or, you know, whatever the case may be. Um, there are times where I do review applications and do make decisions, but um, for the most part, it goes straight to the admissions committee. So I would, I would imagine that you being familiar and being able to advocate actively for a student would have a lot of weight, whereas like the committee, they have no firsthand connection with the students that are applying. Right. right? And not even yes. the opportunity for that, really, and mm -hmm. except for exceptional cases, perhaps, right? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I can, I can think of students who are, got into Baylor because, I mean, I'm, I mean, there are other regional counselors who make the decisions, but 
for our school where I don't always make decisions, I can think of students who got accepted because I knew them and because I was able to advocate for them. And that I think is probably typical whenever you have a holistic review and it's not like the size of a UCLA, 100,000 have to right. be everything in a machine type of system, yeah. right? Okay, great. Yeah, that's excellent. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Okay, so moving on to academics. Mm -hmm. Just in terms of like how rigorous is your standard course load, which departments are the heaviest mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. the most competitive uh, to get into in terms of what students need to prepare for during high school? Yeah, definitely. I would say that the standard of education at Baylor is pretty rigorous. Um, so students do need to be well prepared. And again, that's why I mentioned why the academic piece is so important. Um, Again, at the same time, there's a lot of support for students, but um, like our engineering program, we say that's basically at an honors level. So most engineering students won't be in the honors college that I mentioned. Um, I think like pre-med, all the pre-professional programs are pretty heavy as far as case, you know, courses that you're taking. Um, and so I would say most of the programs are gonna be pretty rigorous. Um, if you come from a really highly competitive high school, I have talked with students once they get to there, like, okay, this is definitely manageable um, because mm -hmm. they're used to that. Um, so that is helpful. As far as most competitive, again, we don't have impacted majors. The only program that is limited in number is our aviation sciences, our pilot pro pilot concentration, because we only have so many planes. <laughs> so that one is um, that one is uh, impacted, right. I guess. So I would say for sure apply with the November first deadline if you plan to be a pilot. Um, okay. But as far as the other ones, um, engineer, uh, pre-med and pre-dental and pre-vet have test score requirements, which I won't get into the details, but um, other than that programs, you just list the major on your application and you'll be admitted um, into the program. Okay. Engineering so then, did have a test score requirement, but with everything going on, they waived it for this fall. Uh, yeah, well, that's good. So a little bit of a reprieve. So, okay, so basically there's not too much competition to get into most majors, except for a couple of special cases where there's some limited airplane facilities and yeah. other types of uh, testing requirements. That's yeah, cool. I would say um, in February, it probably does get more competitive when it comes to major because we're forming our class. So if we have students who are in our heavy majors where they're really large and we have students who are applying in smaller programs, we might go with those. So again another reason to apply in early action i would say it does not matter mm -hmm. uh, but then as, as you get closer later, to the end of the process and you're just trying to fill in the last few seats mm -hmm. if you're applying regular february 1st you want to think about maybe applying to something that's less popular <laughs> I mean, or you do you have like a, have an option which is like you choose like i'm undecided you choose is, is that just undecided um, choose we do we do have undecided we don't tell them what they would be i mean i would say like if you are know you want to do business you should apply as business because yeah. if that's just like the right thing to do but right. you should apply november 1st let's just avoid the problem and apply right. yeah first. avoid that whole problem by just applying earlier <laughs> yeah. fair fair enough um you did cover this quite a bit uh, in your presentation, but my next question was just what kind of supports do they receive on campus? You'd mentioned some tutoring. Um, so that yeah. tutoring is just like students have to go find that or how, how would students engage with that? Yeah, definitely. So um, we have the um, Paula Foster Success Center. It's in one of our buildings. And so um, you can get online and see what tutoring is available and when, and then you can go to the sessions. Um, as far as advising, you'll be advised before every semester to make sure you're on track for your four-year graduation um, plan, and so you won't have to feel like you're trying to figure out your degree plan on your own. Mm -hmm. um, so with, again, tutoring, it's available, and um, all of our freshmen will do a freshman seminar class, usually tied to your major, and so that is a smaller group of students with a professor, and they'll talk about these things, let you know what's available, um, talk about time management, transitioning to college, all of those important things. It's a, okay. I think it's a six week program um, in the fall. And then with okay. counseling and healthcare, we do have a health um, healthcare office on campus um, with some doctors and nurses and yeah, prescriptions and all of that. Um, I would, with insurance, you'll just wanna check before what's the better option. And then there are two major hospitals in Waco, urgent cares, doctor clinics, all of that. Okay. We also offer free counseling for our students. Um, so that is an option as well. And then there's even, we have a recovery mm -hmm. um, 
office for students who are you know battling addiction so um, mm -hmm. trying to avoid the stigma involved in that and have that available as far as safety on campus we have our own um, police um, department on campus our campus has all the light posts around camp the blue light mm -hmm. posts where the you blue can, lights you know, yeah those are yeah press the button and that kind of national thing. standard now it seems mm -hmm. yeah and there is a shuttle that goes around campus um, it's definitely a walking campus you can get anywhere in like probably 10 to 15 minutes but there is a shuttle that runs till 2 a.m so like if you're at the library or the science building and you want to get back to your dorm and you don't want to walk you can wait for the shuttle that's cool okay great just realized we only have about 15 minutes left here i didn't oh, realize okay. time's having okay so um Career resources, internships, co-ops, looking beyond. You did mention this. Um, I was just curious, really like what kind of, you said a lot of those internships were tied up in the majors that students are doing. So would that be like a, a course or is it like the professor is gonna see, how would you get a program that would have an internship involved in it? How does that? Yeah, so I would say like most of our business students will do an internship at some point um, during usually the summer after their junior year, mm -hmm. uh, our apparel design, um, and product development students do an internship, build their portfolio. So again, we want you to have hands-on experience outside of the classroom. Um, with internships, you if it's not something that's already in your curriculum, then you can just talk with professors, talk with the career and development office, and they'll help you get set up for internships. Again, most students do them over the summer, so you can kind of commit more time to them versus trying to juggle that in classes. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you wanted to do, do it, if you wanted to do it during the school year, you could do that as well. Or maybe you mm -hmm. want to do it over the summer, but somewhere else. So mm -hmm. um, maybe our um, we've had business students who have done their internship in China because it's such a great opportunity. So mm -hmm. there's yeah. they can do them you know, wherever they can find them that. anywhere in the world, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and then what about co-ops? Are you guys big for co-ops on campus? Not so much? No, we don't. I don't really even know how to explain a co-op, so no. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, some schools are bigger on it. Some schools aren't, but that's fine. Um, just curious, um, I know international student, especially like the, we talked a lot about financial aid, is usually mm -hmm. lacking for international students. Most schools just, it's not federally supported. I'm just curious, like, if I'm an international student and I'm applying and I'm applying for financial aid, how does that affect my standing in the process for applications? Is that like a really limited pool of funding that you have available if I'm a mm -hmm. need-based client applicant? As far as need-based aid, unfortunately, we have very limited funding for international students. For merit, everybody is qualified for that. Equal. Um, and we don't charge a difference for out-of-state students. Okay. Uh, but for international, unfortunately, it would, it would mostly just be the merit scholarship. So international students still have the same access to your merit-based scholarships just nothing that's need-based, because that's all federal monies that are kind of supporting that, right? Yeah, if they are, so it kind of gets a little complicated. If you're international and you live international, there is a very small scholarship possibility, but I wouldn't say it's like a make or break for anybody, um, but it's not really awarded as much to domestic internationals. Mm -hmm. Right, but that you're talking about like when you say domestic internationals, like somebody who's attending high school on an I twenty. Uh, yeah, so somebody who lives here in California but is an international student. Yeah, okay, but green cards would be considered just like uh, resident of citizens, right? For mm -hmm. for that financial aid. Okay, great. Um, yeah, just anything memorable about essays or applicants from last season, just. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm curious about like the things that stand out to you, not maybe one in specific, but just kind of themes or anything that you think makes an applicant really stand out for you. What, what kind of things from your experience have done that for you? Yeah, so I think um, with essays, I think a lot of students, and for good reason, because some schools put a really a lot of weight on the essay. I would say we don't put a huge weight on the essay and what is really important to us, you have to do one, but really important to us is a short answer. So for with okay. the essay, I would really just find one of the prompts that, you know, resonates with you um, and, you know, just do your best to let us know if this is all we were to know about you, mm -hmm. if we didn't have the rest of your application, what do you want us to know about you? Um, and so I think um, I can tell you one essay I read that I was doing a, a workshop and I was like, maybe you need to come up with something else. He talked about defending his little sister because somebody took her candy away. And I was like, I, that's not the way you want to go. And then he talked about this other like service opportunity that he had. I'm like, yeah, let's do that one. Um, mm -hmm. So I think again, with the essay, if 
if this is all that we have, what do you want us, what's the most important thing that you want us to know about you? Um, mm -hmm. Because with, at least, you know, with Baylor, um, I mean, on the Common App, the last option is to write an essay of your own. Mm -hmm. And so that would be my advice. And then again, the short answer is really important because we want to see what it is that interests you about Baylor and how you why connect, you to right? Baylor. How you connect. So the essay is definitely trying to find some kind of a personal flair. What's connecting? You say you spent more attention on the short answer than the actual main essay. That's mm -hmm. where we actually pay attention to you rather than everybody as the applicant, yeah. right? Um, but what about outside of just the essay? Like when a student does reach out to you versus not reaching out, like how much of a difference will that make for you to be able to advocate? It's like, again, like you were saying, responding to emails, like, what would you say are the main things, in addition to the essay, that makes students stand out for you to be willing and happy to advocate for them? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it's showing, like, a genuine interest. Um, I think over the summer is when we get a lot of generic emails, like, can you tell me about your exercise physiology program? And it's like, I mean, you can learn that from the website. So. Right. I, I don't mind, I will answer your questions, but like if that's all that the engagement is gonna be, then that, you know, it's kind of like, oh. But, you know, if you talk about like, I don't know, just um, even like if you say like, oh, I was looking at the Summer of Discovery and I saw that you offered this class or, you know, right. can you tell me more about that program because, mm -hmm. or specific questions. I think like, um, and then just letting me know like, hey, I, I submitted my application, I'm really excited. That okay. way I can track it. Um, you know, looking, um, I mean, there are, there are students that I talk to almost on a daily basis. Um, and then there are students who kind of just check in every few weeks, once a month. And this and is all during the application is... season. These are all active applicants you're talking about right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Well, that's good to know. Yeah. So I'm always advising our students to reach out early and often and be genuine and sincere and ask specific questions that matter to you, not just generic yeah. questions. So I feel like- Yeah, and I think the last piece of advice I would say is like, I love parents. Like I have parents saved in my phone that I'm in touch with. Their students are junior seniors at Baylor. Um, but sometimes I'm like, does the student know he or she's even applying to Baylor? Because <laughs> I've never heard from the student. I only yeah. hear from the parent. I, so I think it's great. I love, again, I, it's a family. I love to be connected with the family, but it is important for you to be connected with me or with what other yeah absolutely 100 percent agree i'm always encouraging our students to put their foot forward and nobody else's mm -hmm. because that's what this transition is about after all right yeah. yeah okay great um i'm afraid that we're running out of time here okay so i want to give everybody time um <clears throat> to ask and answer questions. I'm going to open up. Oh, look, I have a question right here. <clears throat> Could you speak a little bit more about entrepreneurship program? Are there any prerequisites for admission and is there any supplemental application? Yeah, that's a great answer or a great question. Um, so entrepreneurship is one of our majors within the business program. So you don't have to do anything separate except on your application, you would put pre-business and you can list um, entrepreneurship as what you would like to major in. Um, you don't have to do a separate application. You would be admitted to Baylor as a pre-business student. Again, you would take your first two years of general ed and general business, as well as some lower level entrepreneurship classes as you want. And then at the end of your sophomore year, you do have to, um, you do have to uh, maintain a 3.0, and then you would declare your major in entrepreneurship. And it is a really neat program. Um, it's a smaller program, so you have a lot of interaction with your professors. Um, you, you do an, a, like an internship type thing where you actually create a business. And so um, you kind of learn everything from the floor up to actually creating a business. So it is a really great program. Okay, awesome. Yeah, that was a great question. Thank you, Joe. Okay, we got another question. Mm -hmm. How do you evaluate a student's transcript if they repeat a bad year? I think, I think this question is like if they have a year and they want to like retake ninth grade or 10th grade or something. How would that look to you in review? Yeah, that's a good question as well. So we, um, when we are evaluating for our November 1st deadline, we're looking at 9th through 11th grade. So if you either retook courses or retook a lot of courses, um, most likely the classes would just average out. So we won't pull out the bad grades and replace them. 
But at the same time, that is something that is really good for me to know so that I can advocate if your GPA is a little bit lower because of that, then I can advocate and say, this student's GPA is lower because we recalculated the old and the new grades. But if you look at, you know, this was a situation or this was a circumstance and this is why that happened. Right. Um, so like the you know, scenario on our end that we see frequently because we do work with a lot of international students transitioning in mm -hmm. here in ninth, 10th, 11th, yeah. 12th grade is that they want to come in and retake a grade, especially because in China, the system there, it doesn't track perfectly. They got the three years of high school instead of the four. Mm -hmm. So they finish middle school and then they transition to high school. And it's just, it's a bit of a jumble in that, in, in that uh, transition. So that would be the kind of thing to either, what would you say, like write you an email, give you a phone mm -hmm. call, let you know, hey, this is my situation. My grades yeah. don't look great this year because I came over here and hit the wall. But yeah. then I picked myself up and did it again, and now I'm doing great. Yeah, and I actually can think of one student in this exact situation um, from here in, Sa in California, and it was ex that exact same thing. She had moved here, didn't have a great, you know, had it just didn't work. It wasn't the same, um, and she ended up, I advocated for her, and she was admitted. So um, definitely, I would say an email, just because it's good to have everything written right. so I can make notes and that kind of thing. Um, as far as admitting students with a C, we definitely do have students with a C. I would say if you have a solid three, 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 four unweighted with a good test score, that's a good place to be. Um, and if uh, if it's lower than that, that's definitely something I would want to be aware of so I can look at your file. There is a section on the application. It's like, is there any additional information mm -hmm. you want the admissions committee to know? And that's yeah. a good place also to explain um, what has happened or that kind of thing. And so with that, I would say to send me that information as well in an email so I can track it as well. Yeah, okay, great, yeah. So are there like, just following up on that question, like if I'm applying to say like uh, biochemistry and I'm getting C's in bio and chem in high school, is that the kind of thing that you would say is bigger red flag than if say I was applying to uh, journalism and I got a C in bio? We honestly, we don't really look at it that way. Mm -hmm. um, you're just admitted into Baylor. Okay. So you might need to reevaluate that personally if you right. are struggling with that at okay. the high school level. Is that really what you want to do um, in college? But we wouldn't say, I mean, if you get into Baylor, again, only if, like, again, right now the pre med, pre debt, and pre vet are the only ones with the test score requirement still in place. Right. So as long as you met that and you got into Baylor, you would be in that program. Got it. Okay, good. Um, all right, next question was, um, <clears throat> without SAT scores this year, and most schools giving pass, no pass for this spring semester, um, how do you feel that's going to impact your evaluation of students that are applying this fall for our juniors, especially? Yeah, um, so on the, for the academic piece, Again, right now we are still requiring the SAT or ACT, and I know that the SAT has put out um, notification that they're planning, if able, they're planning to start doing um, exams every weekend starting in August. So we, at this point, believe that there are still opportunities for students to be able to take those exams. If, again, that shifts and they aren't able to offer the exams, um, I honestly, I would be speculating on what we would do at this point. Um, we would have to do something different because we have always looked at test scores. So um, I guess the best advice would be stay in touch and stay tuned. Yeah, definitely stay in stay touch. Stay on your radar. <laughs> yeah. And for the past, if you're not on our mailing list, um, we'll get you on there. That way you're getting up-to-date information. Um, mm -hmm. With the pass, no pass, again, that is um, something we'll look at night through kind of Look at it as this, it comes, you know? Yeah, I mean, we'll just, we just understand. If you didn't pass any of them this semester, I think there would be red flags, but. Especially in a pass, no pass setting. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah I, I, I can definitely see that. But I also understand that that's a tough question to give a specific answer to because it's uh, unfolding as we speak. Although I will say from my vantage point, I'm on our education foundation and uh, it looks like we uh, will be offering summer school on campus for the high school students oh, in Arcadia, which is good news coming out. It's not official yet, but uh, I think that a lot of schools are starting to look at so. summer being a time when they could potentially reopen small sections. So anyway, uh, I think we're at our three o'clock hour. 
Great. So I want to just say thank you so much, Amira, for yeah, coming on so and fun. sharing with us. I really appreciate the time that you've taken. And thank you to our audience for joining us. Thank you to all of our students and for the great questions. Uh, I think that is all of the questions that we have time for. So until next time, thank you and goodbye.